So, welcome to this talk about integrating React.js with PHP projects. Right? Uh, my name is Nacho Martin. Uh, I work at Lightminius, it's an agency I co-founded. And in the last times, every project needs a rich front end for one reason or another. When you talk to the customer, uh, maybe it's a single page application, but it will be the best choice for them. Or maybe it's a more uh, traditional approach, what would be best. For instance, an admin panel. With, but they always have some requirement. They, it always happens. That is, for instance, uh, they need like this, some kind of sub application in there, uh, complex application which needs a lot of JavaScript in there. For instance, uh, um, a calendar for bookings that you cannot do it in static, static HTML anymore or with jQuery. So we have been thinking about this, how to solve this for some time, and we really like uh, React JS and React Native, the mobile version. Mm, we have been using it for some time now. So this talk will be very practical, but I would like to address this, this question, this uh, uh, thing that I see from some friends of mine um, more and more. As the front end has become more and more complex, and there are always new libraries, there's always this new library that is the greatest thing ever invented, and then yes, next, next month appears a new library that is the best thing ever invented, and you shall abandon the last one. So I, some, of friends, some friends of mine just say, you know what, uh, I consider myself a web developer in the past, but nowadays I consider myself a backend developer. I write PHP and I am now specialized. So I just, just focus in providing a great API. Like I do the most beautiful APIs you have ever seen. And I think this, is, this has a good side, uh, which is that you are specialized, so you can help your team to build better products. I mean, it's a way. You are focusing on something, so you become great. But it sometimes comes with this other sentence. They say this and. And you know what? Now that we are thinking some beers, I tell you I don't care anymore about this front end thing. I think it's crazy. And I, I don't care anymore about JavaScript or whatever they are it's consuming my API. And this is not so positive, right? Uh, it has some and I think has some it's a bad, it has a bad side. For instance, uh, in companies, I see sometimes that now that there is an API, for instance, they try sometimes to divide backend and frontend teams and, put them, and don't put them in the same room, for instance. I have seen teams where frontend teams are now under marketing umbrella, and they can only talk by issues in a book tracker. And I have even seen a company where they cannot even talk by any way. They, so they resort to open the door and shouting corridors, like, is your, the API is, the API is not working. What do you mean? Which field? And I've seen that. I don't think that's like, uh, it's not very helpful to build great projects, right? And also there is a bad side, I think, in the, in the, personal, in the personal level. Um, because I think uh, it can make you a bit darker. I know this feeling because I had this exact feeling in a different context this summer, not in the front-end context, but very similar, at least for me, which was this context. I was watching the TV on summer and there were some kids doing this somersault thing, these rolling things. And I just remember, ah, I used to do this when I was a kid. It was like something I could just do. I could like do here, for instance. <laughs> then, but how long have I been without doing this thing? Maybe, well, I said, okay, I have nothing to do. I was in summer and I said, I, I can just try. And then I put myself in position and it become very clear that I couldn't do it anymore. It was absolutely impossible for me. I said, okay, I'm not doing this. Uh, then, but then this came this, this thought, this bad thought. I thought, what if I met the 10-year-old version of myself? What would he think of me as a kid? What he would say, okay, let's see in the future what I am as an adult. Oh, well, I'm this guy, cannot even do a somersault. But, uh, mm, and I think it can be applied also to web development. Okay, I say if, if I think of the version of myself who was uh, so excited about web development and so excited about the internet and uh, when the exact moment when, he put in, when I put in my resume, I'm now a web developer, I can do this. Then if I freeze this moment, if I talk to this guy, maybe he asks me now, what are you doing now? Which kind now you are experienced? Which kind of cool things are you, are you building? What do you mean you are not doing website? What do you mean you only do? You can only do one part. Which part is that? What do you mean level three API restful because if he's not level three, he's not restful at all? Well, maybe, well, maybe it works for you, you know what is best, but uh, it's not what I had in mind. So this is not like the greatest feeling to have. But I think the good news is that if you are just a bit open to the front end, uh, it's very easy to fix this. And I think that React is a 
a brilliant library to do, to do this. To, because React is not a framework in the sense that it's not a set of tiny tools you have to memorize and you have to memorize a lot of calls. I don't like this kind of knowledge where you have to memorize a lot of things, how they combine together. It's more about a few core concepts that are elegant and they are very powerful. And uh, learning React means that you become natural with these with this, with this, uh, concepts, which are, by the way, concepts that at least made me a better programmer. They are about functional programming, they are about declarative programming, they are about managing the state. So let's see which is the fundamental concept, concept of React.js. The fundamental concept, concept, let's think how to build this to-do list for this, okay? It's a to-do list, typical application, and you have this functionality to add items, okay? Or maybe change the order of, of items. So you can, if you do the first version, it's not an omelet because you need to do this, otherwise it's fried eggs, so discover this. Then, how to build this? There are, two there are two options. One is to think just about the state and think, okay, say, whenever I have a new version of the state, I just re-render everything. I clean the component and re-render everything. Okay? This is simple and it's the kind of work I like to do. It's, um, it's about logic, it's about you can unit test it, it's very nice to do, but it's not efficient if you, do a, you have a 1,000 items or 1 million items and you, you just want to reorder two of them and you repaint all of them every time, that's not a good user experience, so we don't use this approach. Instead, we do this other more annoying approach, which is finding the document model, which things to change, which things to move. It's typical jQuery work, for instance, with selectors. This is complex, it's not the kind of uh, problem I like to work, but you have to do it because it's efficient. It's, at the end, it's, uh, your, users, your users count more than that you are enjoying what you're doing. But what if you had Something like well, React says you, okay, you focus on the first one, you do the first one, you focus on the state, which is you, the part of the job that you, you know your business, and I do the second one. So I will, so in fact, the Facebook, Facebook's engineer will do the second one in a very efficient way. So, and in other words, give me a state, like care of the state, and a render method, and I will call it and do it efficiently. So you can pretend that you are just working with the state. If you want more control, you can, of course, there are some hooks to have control over this. Then, with this in mind, let's write our first component, right? We have this very simple component, which is just a counter. We click the counter, and it increases the value, so it adds, uh, produces a new version of the state, which is plus one. This is a component that is simple enough to fit one slide. So this is the full code of this component. There are some things to notice here. We will see this component in detail. Uh, first, I'm using in my slides this new uh, JavaScript syntax. You will see import, class, things like that. This is the new version. This is m much nicer, and I think it's more closer, for instance, to object-oriented programming, like class. Has, I think it's nicer, just nicer, so I use it. I, if it's even easier to understand. But we will see later how to translate this to JavaScript. So normal JavaScript that... Uh, this is also JavaScript, but JavaScript that browsers understand, it, particularly Internet Explorer, of course. But about React itself, we have things like initial state here, how to set an initial state, how to change the state, or not change, but produce a new version of the state, is the right way to think, and render functions. So in detail, initial state, we produce a new object. It's, uh, we produce a, we create an object. This is, a state is always a JavaScript object, just as simple as that. And then we can assign a state by calling set state with a new version. Right? So, uh, it, this is important, this thing of producing a new state, because we are never modifying the state directly. So we are providing a new, like, a new frame, if you think of an animation. Just avoid doing this thing. This is a beginner mistake. You may just think, okay, I changed the state, and it's not working, because React needs to know when, I mean, you have changed your state, and render, or do whatever it needs to do. Then, about the render function, which is something that at the beginning is a bit controversial, just for one day or two, okay, is... Uh, you see this like HTML inside of JavaScript that looks very ugly at the beginning. It's not HTML, it's JSX. React will transform it di uh, internally into JavaScript. It will transform it then into HTML elements. And we will see later how to yeah, really divide the presentation and the code. So, but still, it's something that goes against any good every good practice I've ever had. Like, you have to prepare, but then after two days, you are like, well, why my code is clean? So, I mean, this is not so bad. So. Then, 
good practice to make render as clean as possible. Only a return is possible. At the beginning, ah, sorry. There are some things that change that like, you have to, this is part of memorizing, but this like class is not class because it's colliding with the class in JavaScript, for instance. So it's class name and very few things like that. But, and then you can also insert JavaScript expressions between these pointy brackets. Right? Then, about making render as clean as possible. It's just only do these kind of things. Uh, at the beginning, you don't know where to put your code, and you know that there is a render method, so you try to put your code. I try to put all my code in there, or uh, whatever I could think of the first days. Here, you, we don't modify the state, but never. We, uh, he, here, we don't make Ajax calls. Here, we don't do any other stupid or well, crazy thing we need to do. Okay? We, don't do, we don't change the state of the world here. Okay? It's not something that will work. We have to find somewhere else. We have to write our own methods and call them. Okay. With this, with this that we saw, we can start building our, our application. But if we are just writing a component, it will become very large, like very confusing at the end, a very super component. It's not uh, very clean. So one important concept in React is to think about hierarchy, about parent-children relationships. We, that's how we, how we have small components that combine together. So if you have something like this, you may, uh, from the user interface, it's typically to, from the user interface, you extract which components you need. We call something like this, for instance, this separation. How do we work with props? Maybe our project manager decides that now we need not one counter, but two counters, and they have now a, salute, a greeting in Spanish. I don't know, we don't know why. Say, click me, amigo, click me, senor, is for be more polite, less polite. I don't know why, but you have to do it. So we can just use our component uh, that we wrote, just as if it was just a normal tag. It's not HTML, HTML tag. It's will be translated to JavaScript, so to our code. Then, and then in our counter method, now we can receive this name, this property, as what is called props, a state that is given by your father or your parent. So, and you don't have a function to set props. You cannot change the props from your from children. So this is something that it's immutable for you. So you have to provide, for instance, a callback from your parent, then that's, that's possible, but it's one way binding. This is important. And with this, we have seen a lot of React, like really a lot. Yes, it's a matter of writing and not committing uh, small mistakes that you make at the beginning. In fact, we have seen uh, so much that we can start to provide good practices. Like if your component only depends on props, you can have this short syntax that is only about templating, right? It's, it's, if it's just, you find yourself just writing a render that depending on props, you, have this, you can have this shorter syntax, which is cleaner. It's like a Lambda function in ES6. Then this allows us to do this good practice. If you have a complex component with logic, uh, auto logic like Ajax calls and so on, you can split it in two. And one component has all the logic, and then in the render, yes, renders the presentational component that only depends on the state passed by its parent. Then this always, as you see, about the state and how to render it. Looks like simple, but it's really powerful. And then. Uh, it's everything depending on the state, so we, we can do things like reproduce states. If we store a state, we can reproduce the state of a component or even a tree. We can rewind or time travel. This is particularly powerful in, in Redux. Like undo, for instance, this is something that is not so difficult to do if you are just changing your state. You can log state changes, or you can, for instance, uh, have a storybook. So you have someone who is just um, who is devoted to like change styles or choose the styles. You can have a storybook, there is a library called React Storybook, which is great, and you put all your presentational components there with different combinations of states. So, button disabled, uh, like this, button active, like this, and then they can just change, for instance, CSS and see how it changes. But has more powerful uh, consequences. One of the most powerful consequences is this, what they call learn once, write everywhere, which means that what if instead of this, what if instead of this like HTML-like, uh, component that we had in our counter. What if we have something like this now? This doesn't look like HTML anymore. This has something that is suspicious here. It's uh, this switch IOS thing. It's, this is, in fact, a render view, like a render method of a mobile application, what is called React Native. Then uh, React can take your tags, your HTML tags, or your JS6 tags, and translate it to JavaScript and then to native uh, components, so they are more performant than just a web view. That's how React Native works. And it's because 
yes, the web is just one of the targets. There is one side of React that is React DOM. There is another, React Native. And there are more, some of them by the community, not by Facebook itself. One that I find very cool, this is React Blessed for Terminal. You would say, Terminal, what has to do Terminal with React? Well, Blessed is a, an awesome library to build things like this. Like, you, you know, you see it, but it's like a, they has a map, has charts. So if you are, for instance, in DevOps and you don't want to do anything with front end, maybe you can still use React for things like that. I think it's super cool. And, but then, how to, well, we know more, a bit of React. It's a bit about practicing this. How can we just use it? Like, how can we just, for instance, translate JavaScript, this JavaScript modern JavaScript into JavaScript that browsers understand? Well, recommended setup is to use Webpack. This is a model, module blender. So you have your source files, and you have some configuration to build your, your assets that you serve to the browser. And then uh, Webpack has many good things. Like for instance, manages dependencies for us, which is great. Allows several environments. You have a production environment which is optimized and a development which has, has uh, debugging options. You can do automatic page reload when things change, or even you don't reload the page, but you change the code and the state is the same. So you, without reloading, you, you change the code in there. This is particularly powerful in React as it's about the state. You can use preprocessors or transpilers. I don't like much this word, like because how it sounds. Like Babel. Uh, uh, Babel is like, well, it's for taking a modern version of JavaScript. You can even choose the features, even experimental features, and translate, it, translate them to, yeah, to the JavaScript that particularly Internet Explorer can understand. It has one uh, drawback. It's, of course, a complex, a complex tool, so you need some time, and we cannot present Webpack in detail in this talk. Uh, however, I maintain a sandbox, if you want to look at it, I, with an integration with Symfony. I particularly use Symfony with some things for development and things like that. If you want to check it out, I will uh, upload a slide later. Don't worry. Then, but with this, I mean, let's assume we have Webpack in place. How can we insert React into HTML? So it's very simple. You just provide a tag, can be selected, and then you say to React DOM, the web part of React, to uh, insert the component in there. Then, and this is what a front-end guy will do. We, we are not talking about PHP yet, right? But we can do some things in PHP. Okay, I, we wrote a library called React Renderer. We were looking at some things we wanted to do from PHP in React, and we ended up writing this library. But we were, in fact, copying another library because we saw other, what our other community is doing. And there was this brilliant library called React on Rails, of course, for Ruby on Rails, that made this guy from Hawaii. As you can probably guess, I guess, <laughs> uh, which is very happy, guy. And it, this library is great. Uh, so it, this has two parts. One is the Ruby part, and one JavaScript part that happens that we can use in PHP. So we can start using it. So if you see here React on Rails. That is the JavaScript part. It's nothing to do with Ruby. So we can just register a component here, and we wrote a tweak tag. So you can say here insert my component with these initial props, right? And this will produce this, uh, this, uh, this, this element that then React on Rails knows how to, where to put your component. So this is only uh, something a bit like nice to see, but it's powerful in the sense that now we are rendering from a tweak tag, so we can render whatever we want here. We can render this, or we can render other stuff, and that opens us the door to do server-side rendering. Server-side rendering, other, otherwise, uh, and also called Universal applications are also called isomorphical applications, which happens to have a very particular meaning in maths. It has nothing to do with the meaning we are using here. I don't know who came up with the isomorphical word. I like the word because I like how it sounds, because I go home and they tell me, how about you, what have you been doing today? I say, isomorphical things. And it makes me feel good, and you only live once, but just keep in mind that yeah, you do cannot keep this conversation further with people. You cannot, yeah. So we had this fundamental premise, and this is another consequence. It doesn't say anything about browsers. It doesn't say anything about, I need a running browser. So you can say, what if you give me a representation of a string? If I give you a state, you can give me a string. Yes, of course. So we can do this. It's, this is good for, for instance, uh, search engine optimization. Happens that the Google crawler, some of the Google crawlers have JavaScript, and others not, and you never know. Also, the Facebook crawler for social tags 
can be useful for this. And just to be sure in search engine, faster perceived page loads you present with an initial state, so visual elements are in there. Um, so instead of a spinner, the loader, you present with an initial version to the user. And also we can cache this response, which is quite cool. Then, how it works in this tweak tag, which is, uh, you can say, rendering both, which is, by the way, the default option, and then it will produce this, uh, all the code, like it will be everything in the first state just rendered for us. And then when React on Rails, or React finds uh, our component, wants to inject it, we want to render it, and we'll say, okay, I see that it's already rendered, so I just take control over the component, make it more dynamical, and make it like yeah, yeah, a React application, a typical React application. Then, how this works in the server side, I mean, which options do we have to do really like mm, low-level thing? So, first option is to call a Node.js to processor. Okay, this is uh, just like, it would be the equivalent of opening a terminal. We use for this the simple process component, isolately, without the framework. Uh, in this library, PHP yes, I wrote, uh, an adaptation of one Ruby library I found. So, it just looks, if you have Node.js, it just like opens Node.js and says, okay, here is my code, and he, I want to render this component, give me the string. This is slow because you have to, in how PHP works, after every response, after between requests, you don't share a state, so you have to say bye bye, no DJs. I will call you with 90% of the same call next time, but yes, now I want this other component, all these other props. So this is a pity, but well. Then, if you have V8 DJs, PHP extension installed that allows you to, uh, to write, uh, to execute JavaScript code from PHP, it, this library will use it. Uh, so this is, you have to compile it once, okay, but it's easy to do, it's easy to use. It has the same problem. You have to, you see this, P, this V8 extension and you see, okay, I have to say you goodbye after it's like fired up. Uh, it, this, using PHP PM, I think it's potentially pro can be solved, but I've not tried yet. I think if someone wants to try this, something that can work. Because there is a third option that is fast, so it's using an external node server that is always running. That's a no, anything about our code. Uh, can be, our code can be about banking, about uh, health stuff. No, the node server is the same. So uh, it's a bit annoying because you have to keep it running as another service. You have to, yeah, it has to be alive. Not super annoying either. And it's faster, right? It's just a no thing. Then, options one and two in PHP, you have to provide this renderer you want, PHP executes renderer or external server renderer that uses, say, I will communicate with another server with a Unix socket, so Unix socket. So it was like this. I think that then one possible setup is to have in development option one or two, and in production use external server. And if you can cache in production, it's always better. It's something we can cache. So then now we can now we can do this in PHP or even in Ruby or whatever, because people say, uh, if you want to do this kind of thing, you have to rewrite your code in Node, which freaks me out. Like, I have been working for years in my code. I have my models there. I like, I, I mean, they are good. They are tested. I have to rewrite because I want to do this. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, because it's a JavaScript. Well, it's not like this, but doesn't mean either that you have to do it every time. It's something that introduces some complexity. Well, you have, have to have our Node server uh, running. You have to do some adaptations to your code, so it's not making an Ajax call in the Ajax call in the first time, things like that. But well, something, if you need it, you can do it. Facebook, for instance, doesn't do it for Insta in Instagram. Instagram doesn't do this, even if they are experts, but they are doing in other ca cases. So. so, and then, now let's talk about a bit about library has also some support for Redux. We can also give a brief introduction to Redux. Redux is something that is recommended even by the author of Redux, which is from, I think lives in London at least, or is from London. Uh, Dan Abramov, he says, the first time you use React, don't use, it's better if you don't use Redux. If you have to be aware which problem, which kind of problem does Redux solve. So when you find this problem, you know that you can really refactor your code and make it cleaner by using Redux. So which kind of problem is it? If you are writing an application and it's a bit more complex, you will find that you have different pl places where you use the same state, right? So let's see, we have this hierarchy, okay? Then where should this state live? So as children cannot pass their state to their parents or to their siblings, 
it should live in the first common parent, which is this one. It has nothing to do with the name. And also, you have these intermediate components that are just receiving name and passing it to the children, like, I received this from my parent. I pass to my children. I don't know if, so, if they are still there. So you see the code, and you see name going around, but the component has nothing to do with name. And maybe you have 50 things like this, and you are like, I don't understand my code anymore. And when you don't understand your code anymore, you know something bad will happen very soon. So this is the kind of problem that Redux solves. Right? Redux, it's, uh, I think the important part is you have to have an idea of a circular flow. Okay? I think this is the main point of Redux. Uh, because when you are using Redux, when you're at, the at, the at the beginning, it's not so difficult, but it, the code is split it in several files. So you have to, like, so this is going on to this file, or maybe this other one. So I don't know, uh, until you have the full picture. And if you, when you have this circle, it's better. So in your components, you can just dispatch now actions instead of changing the state. An action is like a description of something that has happened, kind of an event. It's just a JavaScript object with a description of what we want to do. And then, or maybe a click. And then re there is something called reducer that has, like, it's a, like a huge, or, well, can be huge, or you can split in several reducers. It tends to be a big switch construction where you say, okay, if I get, if I receive this, this action, I know how to produce a new version of the state. So I can produce like frames in, like, in an animation, I produce frames. I know how to produce new versions of the state. This state is, lives in a store, and the store is connected to the components. So now the components can receive, are kind of connected, like they receive as props the name so they can re render themselves. So this is also explained with a picture. I don't think it will work in the PDF version, but it's very easy because it will be like a ball moving around, like following the. <laughs> The arrow, so you, you, would, you, you uh, dispatch an action, you create an action, goes to the dispatcher, and then the reducer, using the current state and the action, produces a new version of the state that is connected to the component, which will be updated. So, same circular flow, right? Yeah, okay. So, we can use this in React Renderer, because Ruby on Rails has support for, this, for it as well. So, we just adapted it, and then, you can just register a store, and you can connect your components to this store. So you can have just one component using this store, or you can have several components using this store, which can share a state now. So you can, if you are not doing, for instance, a single page application, no JS people like to do single page applications so much, but I don't do like them so much. So you can have, for instance, things like this. You have static components and React components, and they can just change the state, and the state, well, everyone knows because they share a store. Okay. And this is why like, will be like a general thing for a general application. But there is one special moment where we can do even better. I mean, we can really, there is a point of really a lot of friction, which is forms. Uh, friction between front end and back end teams and technologies, because there is a lot of go other things going on here. When do we need forms in React, which are the cases? Inside of React components, you have a React application, you have a form in there, it will be a React form. Important forms, for instance, uh, with, when it's a purchase form, you are saying, or renting ho a house, and you say, this house is not available on these dates, that you are filling your form, I see that, but I can just give you a recommendation of this other house, so this means better conversions, means more money, and probably means happiness, and also very specific forms, which are very dynamical, or I don't know, a calendar, date picker, like, I have this customer has these ideas, okay, I can do it. Also, forms that are not boring, even they are not related to money. Mm, you can, for instance, this is this company, type form, who builds these surveys. Well, they can, I think the forms can be used for other things than surveys, but this is a good example. Mm, I guess users are more likely to fill the survey if it's like this than if it's like checkboxes or radio buttons, which is what I would like, personally do. Like, you, user, get your user, you have to use these checkboxes, just fill them. I, it's a feeling I would like to have, but. Sadly, it's not happening. It's better to use this. Then, typically, PHP frameworks have a form component that you may think it's only doing forms, but in fact, it's doing a lot of things. So in Symfony, it's called form. Very, yeah. I think in other frameworks, it must be called the same thing. It will be very confusing otherwise. You can populate the form with initial values. You can give hints for which widgets do you want to use. We can bind incoming data, deserialize it into even existing objects, which is very cool. If you try to do yourself by hand one day, it's annoying. You can validate, which is also very annoying to do one manually. 
maybe with another component, but it's like integrated, and have a way to return errors integrated in the form. And then you, they have typically this other side, create view, or helpers in other frameworks, but like in Symfony you create a form view, which is another, like a presentational representation of the form. And this does the render view, which is awesome. If you give it for granted, like it's something awesome to have. Show errors after submit in there, which is also painful to do, and some client side validation. Right? Not so much, but maybe choosing the right type for HTML. But in APIs, I, at least I, I, I like to use forms still in APIs to receive requests from post, put, for to date, create, or patch, things like that, to update values or create new, uh, new models. Uh, you miss many of these things that you gave for granted before, and you were so happy you didn't know. Like, you cannot have initial values anymore. Like, you can serialize your model, maybe, but sometimes, in many cases, it's not the same representation. Maybe you have a date in the form, which is selector month, year, day, and yeah, you serialize your model as a string, so you have to work a bit more on this, it's some overhead. You cannot give user interface hints, you cannot return errors easily, you have to serialize your form in some data you understand, and of course, you, we miss everything, we don't have anything in the right side. So, and also, if we want to do this kind of work in JavaScript, we typically want to do even more stuff. We want on sub validation, if there are obviously errors in there, like the price is negative, I don't want you to even ask the server. If the price is negative, that's wrong, so you can just send an error, show an error to the user. Or on blur, sync validation, password is not strong enough, just keep working on this form. Or on uh, async validation, uh, just check with the, f the server, your username is already chosen, I have these options for you, or whatever dynamic thing you, dynamic thing you want. So, but I still use forms for this because this is super good to have, right? Then, suppose this Symfony form. This Symfony form, in example, is typically in, a, in other frameworks, it's a choice, yes, with some countries, three countries in this case, and yeah, the value you show to the user, United Kingdom, and the value you want to receive in the, in the, in the post, GB, Deutschland, España, España, ES, and then a collection of addresses. This is simple and typical, but if I have to do this in, a, in an API context, I start to say, okay, have to do this. Why? Because in, if you are just using static HTML, you have this create view and creates perfect representation of the form. Like, everything is done, so you just create view. Is there, with the right choices, with everything. And then if you submit, you receive the exact data you want, not whatever someone interpreted from the documentation or whatever was written in the documentation, who knows who wrote, who wrote these documentations. I'm <laughs> so, and then you submit, you bind the request, and then yeah, everything works, but in API, you don't have create view, so you have to, yeah, guess, okay, or based on the documentation, so show the corridors maybe, we see, hey, Deutschland is not there. What's going on? So, read the documentation. What do you mean, documentation? I didn't know. Even it, it existed. And then, if, even if I'm writing this myself, the both parts, JavaScript and PHP, when I press submit, I know that it will fail. Like, I, I, never, I, I never guess, in a complex form, I never guess the right presentation the first try. And I start receiving errors like this. Not extra fields. What do you mean? Uh, value selected is not a valid choice. Okay, I'm not sure, I have to check. Things like, one of more given values is invalid. You have a long form, like, well, uh, yeah, this like, what's going on? And then, well, this was animation throwing the computer, which is the feeling I have, and someone is like, why is taking you so long? It's just a form, and you are like, just leave me alone, leave me alone, I have to fix this, I know I will fix it. What's the problem we have? So, now we have to keep in sync three se separate things. Form in the server, API documentation, API documentation, and form in the client. And this introduces some overhead. Okay, if you have on, to do only three, four forms, that's okay. You can live with this. You can argue a bit with the front-end guy for some time, and then you can be friends. But what happens if your application has to do a lot with forms? Like, we have this cast, customer. They are some dietitians, and they wanted to build uh, like an expert system, so you, they gather, interview, uh, gather inter uh, information from the patients in an interview what, I mean, about, about them a lot of information, and we build uh, diets based on what they, how they are physically or what they prefer. So, 
So we were very excited about this. Oh, we want this to do this system, expert system. We think it's so cool. How can we do this? We were discussing about this. And someday, I remember I asked the guy, what do you have in mind about the interview? What do you have in mind? Just tell me what you have in mind. And he was like, well, yeah, actually, yeah, we gather a lot of data. And we wanted to have a step-by-step -step form, because otherwise we'd be huge. I, OK. And yeah, just send me the first, like, first thing. For, uh, yes, don't work so much on it, but just send me what you have in mind. And I preserved this document for historical reasons in my company, which was this. And we were like, okay, and they started to say, this is just the first version, like, because we want different markets, and yeah, it will be like, we will be changing things all the time. And they send us like, some ideas they have, like, if you choose you are, if you are a woman, of course it asks you if you are pregnant, which month of pregnancy, or stuff like that. If you, so this is yeah, asking you if you are pregnant in Spanish, by the way. Or if you say, I, must, I, I practice sports, how serious are you? You are taking supplements before, after, mm, these kind of things, a lot of yeah, ramifications. Also, they wanted always to use iPad. They use iPad and they want sliders for everything, like everything can be used with a slider. They want to do this thing. So it was like the most important thing, a sliders. Like for hours, for everything. Well, OK, that's. Then if your front-end and back-end teams are just communicating with, with an API and they don't care about each other, this can introduce a lot of overhead, a lot of delays, I think, and which I think is even more important, even if your project sees the light, maybe you will see that the front-end guy and the back-end guy, in the Christmas party, they tend to not sit together. Like, <laughs> they are like, no, I've been arguing with this guy for the whole year, uh, I, I hate him. So <laughs> this is... This is not great to have. I mean, it's not the way to build greater, better products, right? So we were thinking, how can we fix this? What do we need? So we're missing this. We're missing this create view thing. So we can build something, maybe, right? In API, it always means serializing. So the answer of everything is serializing. Okay, then in which format? What happens that there is a very good format for this, which is JSON schema, which is a standard. People, I. See, then to use it to serialize models, but I think it's also great for serializing forms. So, well, I think um, mo more people think that uh, it's not our idea to serialize forms. Uh, with every standard, happens that when you read the specification, at least me, I don't understand anything. It's impossible to understand these kind of sentences. But uh, it's easier if you see an example. Like, this is how JSON schema looks. Has properties, validation rules, types. You can even add your own uh, options in there is not so strict about that, so we can add like user interface. We want to use this widget here, so we said, okay, this is great. Let's use this. Let's serialize. We were looking about people who were doing things like that, where people using Symfony. Uh, we are using Symfony, so Symfony component. You can take this idea to your other frameworks as well. But we build serializer for Symfony components. So there was this guy who was do, using forms to uh, to create forms in the terminal in the console. So we use the same approach that he was using. Uh, the library, by the way, is published, is this one. So uh, basically, you, are, you have a resolver who has a lot of transformers, register. You can register more or create your own. So on these transformers, uh, the resolver looks field by field and says, OK, I apply this transformer to this, to this field, and I get this slice of the, uh, recursively, I get this slice of the form. So you get a full representation. Maybe this one is a text area, so you can extract a lot of information from here. Or maybe, for instance, it's a date time. So can, you can say the format is date time, the widget is date time. You can have required values. And in fact, you can extract potentially, uh, I think, all the information that form view can use. It's easier to do than a whole view. So we were very happy because we, ah, sorry, we also needed two serializers that we wrote, or the second one we copied from uh, for, uh, FOSS REST bundle, which is a bundle in Symfony to serialize uh, errors and to serialize initial values from the form. Right. Two other things we needed, I think easier, but also useful. And with this, we had this left part complete. Right? So, but we're still missing the second part where we can say, OK, we are backend developers. We, we have done our job because now we have backend and even a documentation that is always on sync, describes what we can do. So we, the number of issues decreases. right? But happens that when, once you have a JSON schema, you want more things because you can just have them for free. Like, for instance, you can just say, look, we have JSON schema now. Just using this AGB library or other libraries, you can validate your data against the schema. And you, if you see that there is an error, just present to the user. 
and you don't even have to send me a request because maybe like, the price is negative or something regular expression is not uh, it's not right. So we start receiving less requests, which is also nice. And also happens that we have a complete uh, representation of the form, so we can write generators. And there are many generators for React or uh, vanilla JavaScript. I've not explored the full field of generators, but I've explored the React ones. I think if you want to use one, I think maybe the first option or the best option will be use the Mozilla one, which is like has been for some time, and people is contribute, is, has contributed a lot. Has been, is, I think, it's quite stable. Uh, we couldn't use it, so we wrote our own because it was not uh, extensible enough. We couldn't do easily, or I, I didn't show the way to build a wizard form, for instance, or to customize it so much. So we wrote our own, also using Redux form, which is a library that we think is awesome for forms. And anyways, if you are going to create your own generator, it's not something crazy, especially if you only support some bit widgets. You don't need a color picker. Like I had to provide a color picker to publish, publish in this Publishing this library, I was like, okay, maybe someone used a color picker, so I wrote this widget. But sometimes you don't need all of them. Then, Redux form, which is the library which is doing the work in our case, uh, the work has a representation that is powerful in Redux. You can use it without, of course, without this library. You can have all kinds of validation. You can write your own widgets. And you know from the beginning that it's flexible enough, because if you see the front page, they have an example, for instance, for us, for Wizard forms, which is something if you are writing a form library, it's not something people tend to do like in the first place. They say, okay, maybe you can adapt our library. But if they are flexible enough, they say, okay, you can use it whatever you want. I mean, the way you want. And they did, so we need, we can succeed doing this. Then, using this is, well, there is some boilerplate, importing, so on, but the important part is like this, is this, using this component, the form. And passing an schema and, and submit function, it also has validation uh, other stuff. You can also control it, passing more props, like more arguments, but this is the simpler version that also fits in the screen. And then with this, basically we can have a JSON schema and create React, uh, a React representation, like a React form. And with this, yeah, we got all of this. So we said, okay, now we can focus on the part that we really would like to do in this project. And we were so happy, and we had everything. And then, well, as I said, I maintain a sandbox for these concepts, the libraries we are publishing, or so on. Maybe you can, if you are using Symfony, you can take directly the concepts, or you can use a sandbox, maybe, for something, for starting or something, or taking examples. If you are not using Symfony, maybe you can use the uh, libraries without, like, the bundle part is like the connection of the libraries, which are pure PHP with Symfony, but the libraries can be used standalone. Uh, if you are using, if you are not using React, maybe you can take the idea from this talk of using, for instance, JSON schema, or using Redux can be used without React, React by the way, which is a very nice library. Uh, but in any case, I will, uh, if you are not doing any front end at all, like, I would like just ask you to be a bit, yes, uh, open about these front end people, uh, because just by thinking about what they do or, or thinking about the front end, you can. Uh, sometimes, many times, just yes, uh, do a better job together. And also, which is uh, the main goal of this talk, which is that you have a nice Christmas party, like to save the Christmas. So people are really happy in Christmas party, which is very important. So if you have questions, or well, this is my contact details if you want later, or I don't know. That's it. Thank you.